Hello and welcome to this session named Challenges of Using V4L2, that's Video for Linux 2, to capture and process video sensor images. Thank you for attending this uh, presentation. I will uh, start by first introducing myself. My name is Eugen Christev and I am um, an embedded Linux engineer at Microchip and I'm part of the MP32 Linux team. We are a division inside Microchip. My main uh, area of uh, developing a focus and interest is regarding uh, stage two and stage three bootloaders. And uh, I'm also developing Linux kernel device drivers. The main point regarding the presentation, the most in interesting fact is that I am also maintaining and developing the V4L2 drivers for microchip, Video for Linux 2 drivers, which are the TML sensor controller and the TML sensor interface. So that's about myself. Let's uh, have a small agenda about what I will be presenting today. And uh, the summary states the following. I will start by explaining how digital sensor walls work, how they um, work and how they send uh, images. And then I will try to continue with what happens with the data once it gets into our pipeline, into hardware, into software, and how this data is turned into real photos that you can see on your screen in the end of the pipeline. Then I will try to present what uh, can happen during this process, what issues can occur, what challenges we have to see to obtain a better photo, a better quality of the photo, and how we can cope with these situations, how we can alter the pipeline functionality, and how V4L2, Video for News 2 subsystem, can help us by finding the cause of the issues and to uh, alter the the pipeline, the software and the hardware pipeline to get a better picture quality and to solve the issues that we'll be presenting today. At the start, I will show you the system diagram of the system that I will be presenting. And this is the, the top diagram, the complete diagram, and we will get into details in the following slides. As a small summary of the beginning, you can see how the user interacts through video for Linux 2 system with the hardware and the software, the drivers, and how, where is the sensor placed according to the hardware pipeline, the sensor control driver, video for Linux 2, and the user itself, regarding user space and also kernel space. So, as I said in the agenda, let's move to the first topic. And uh, we start from the beginning, which means what is a digital video sensor and how does the sensor works? How did it obtain the data we need for taking a photo? And to explain that, let's see the exact functionality of a sensor. On the right side of the slide, you will see an explanation of the image sensor and how the lights, the light enters the sensor through those photosensitive cells and how the light is being split into different um, color types, different spectrum. And we can see that uh, inside the sensor, we have different uh, photo cells which are sensitive to green, to blue, and to red. And these photo sensitive cells then convert the absorbed light into data which we can obtain at a later point. This array that we have inside the sensor is called the buyer array. This buyer array is depicted on the photo on the left side of the, of the slide. And we can see the exact uh, look of this array how it looks like and how the pixels are displayed in this array, the blue, the green, and the red. So this happens inside the sensor. In summary, with the light is being split into different colors and then captured inside the bio array. This bio array looks uh, in this way. And let's see if we can think about what this bio array uh, involves and why this bio array was chosen like this. Um, again, if we look at the bio array, we see that uh, we ha actually have more green pixels than red or blue. And um, if we notice that, we can answer to that question. And the answer is that the human eye is much more sensitive to green light rather than blue or red light. So the bio array tries to get more information from the incoming light considering the green light rather than the blue and the red. And uh, why this pattern was chosen? It was chosen to make um, less uh, cost and be effective and to make it simpler to, to develop afterwards. 
if we see this viral array, we can uh, ask ourselves if we lose color information during this process, if the pixels, uh, the distance between the pixels is too big or what happens if we lose color information considering one pixel is blue, one pixel is green, one pixel is red. We will see that in the following slide, what happens with the color information and how we manage to not lose color information from one pixel to another. And we will also see what we can do with this, um, with this information and convert the pixels from the bioarray into a real photo. If we look at the down part of the slide, we can notice that this photo is actually an interpretation of the buyer array. Uh, seeing, we can see it exactly as the buyer array sees it. We can distinguish the green pixels, the red pixels, and the blue pixels on this photo. And while we look at it, we understand what's in the photo, but um, it's not really it does not really look like a photo which uh, we can normally see and normally take with a, a photo camera. So the, we will see the process of turning this bio array, this photo into a real photo, which we can use. After the photo cells get the information, the light information, as I said, actually the sensor uses a analog to digital converter and we see the information as bits. So this was the talk related to the bio array. I explained how, what is a bio array and how it works how it captures light and how this light is turned into bits. But with this pixel data, what happens next? What do we do with these um, bits? And how can we obtain a real image? And the answer to that, we're looking at the buyer array and to solve this problem is uh, what is called the buyer interpolation. The buyer interpolation is a process in which each pixel from the buyer array will get information from the neighbors the neighboring pixels to get enriched and obtain data such that each pixel will have all the channels information like we are expecting from a real photo. We can see on the left side, we have a photo that is um, a bio array. We can see the whole pixels, the difference between the pixels. And on the downside of the slide, in the bottom part, we can see um, the pixel split per channel. So we have a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel for the bio array. Actually, in the green channel, there are both green channels. And on the middle of the slide, on the upper part, we can see the photo which was taken after the bio interpolation. So this bio interpolation process is the process in which actually every pixel from the bio array will get information from the neighbors and it will be enriched with data such that in the end, we have a photo that looks exactly what we expect. A photo which is not pixelated and not split in per channel as in the buyer array. So this uh, interpolation process is done in the pipeline in hardware. Um, by hardware dedicated block, they will perform this calculation for each pixel on the incoming pixel stream. Okay, we understand what is in the, the buyer interpolation. We see what happens when we take pixel data off the sensor. But the issue and the challenge that we have here with this interpolation, we ask ourselves, if this process is flawless, does it have any issues? Can we find some problems with this process or not? And to answer that, we see, yes, we have some issues with interpolation and what can happen, the pitfall of the interpolation process or, or the demosaicing process, is the fact that on edges, we can have strange artifacts appearing in the photo. If we closely look at the photo, which we have on this slide, if we notice on the upper part, there are some strange artifacts. And uh, maybe you have not seen it yet, but I will try to put another photo, which is zoomed in on the artifacts I wanted to show you and circled in black. You can see that on this edge, there are specific light artifacts, some pixels that should not be there, some strange colored pixels on the edge. And why this happens on the, or because of the bio array, because of the interpolation, it's because the pixels which are right on the edge will get neighbor information from the uh, neighbors which are on the other side of the edge. So the edge will be mixed up between all the pixels at the edge. We do not have clear edges with this interpolation algorithm. What can we do to solve that? 
we can see another photo of the same scenery or sim very similar scenery in which the artifacts are missing. And this time the artifacts have been fixed. And what we can do about this is in the dedicated hardware, we can compute the fact that we have an edge, we can detect edges. So sometimes it is possible during, using a special algorithm to detect if we have edges inside the photo. And we do that by uh, actually seeing if there are pixels of the same colors and there is a very big difference between a lot of pixels on one side and the other side of the edge. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. Not all the edges are fully detected at all times, but this algorithm will try to prevent the strange artifacts which I showed you previously. Inside the system, what happens is that the image sensor produces the pixel stream. We can see on the left side of the screen and the wire interpolation and the edge detection mechanism inside the hardware pipeline will be responsible to do the interpolation and the hardware detection. And the user can interact with this using the video for Linux 2 subsystem interface, which is the arrow on the left side. The resulting image is then taken by the user uh, from the kernel space through the special character device. So this is a small diagram of exactly how things happen inside Linux and inside the system. Now, let me explain another issue that can happen during the process of image acquisition of image processing during the hardware and the software pipeline. And uh, this one problem which I want to explain is what I call the color problem. And this is closely and tightly related to how we see the light. Normally we see light uh, as a single entity, just light, we call it light. But in fact, what I will tell you is that the light has a temperature. And um, this temperature affects the way we see the light and the way the sensor sees the light. In this photo, we can see that a specific light on the left side has a specific light color, which is uh, more um, orange, more yellowish. And we can see on the right side that the other light is more bluish. And the color temperature of each of these lights is on the left side is uh, 1000 Kelvin and on the right side is 10,000 Kelvin. We can see a very big difference in the, that the light color affects how we actually see the object's colors. And we can uh, move further and I will try to show you a photo. Let's take an example of a photo and we can see, we have a close look at this photo. We can watch it for a few seconds. Uh, not no problem with that, and we can see it. We can distinguish a uh, rock, some water, a sky, some trees. That's okay. We can distinguish that. We can see it. What I will ask you now is, what is the color of the water in this photo? What is the color of the rock? What is the color of the sky? Maybe we are tempted to say that the water is blue, the sky is blue, the rock is white. That's one thing to say about this photo. We can see that. I will ask you again the same thing on this photo, which is actually almost the same photo, but not quite the same. We can see some differences in color. We can see that in this photo, the, the light and the color is much more natural. We can see the exact blue water, the blue sky and the white rock. Is there any big difference between the other photo? And why is that? Actually, what I'm trying to tell you is that we also see with our brain, not just with our eyes. Let's look at this black and white photo, which is again, a simple photo taken in black and white, and you can distinguish a sky and maybe some trees or some bushes and some rock on, on this photo. But um, do we understand what's in this photo? Do we see the colors there? It's black and white, we cannot see the colors that clear, but our brain can understand the colors there. We can actually picture with our mind that we have some green bushes and the blue sky. If we remember from old times photography long ago that uh, we used to have what is called sepia photography. And again, the same photo we see now in uh, sepia. And um, if you look at this photo, I will ask you again, do you see colors in this photo or not? Maybe you will say, okay, there are not many, many colors, but then I will say, what's the difference between the sepia photography and the black and white, which you see previously? And uh, I will tell you that sepia is 
again a monochrome photo. So CPA is a photography made of shades of brown, while black and white is made of shades of gray. So actually CPA is not a color photo, it's just a monochrome photo. But our brain can understand the colors even if this is a monochrome photo. So what I'm trying to emphasize with all this talk regarding colors is that our brain can see much more than our eyes can see and that the sensor does not have a brain and needs to be teached to be uh, understand what is the light around it and how it can adapt the coloring to the specific light that is seen in the scenery. How we do that? How we can do that? This is a process which is called white balancing. And uh, again, I will show you the picture side by side to see the differences before white balancing and after white balancing. More examples with the same photo which we saw in black and white and in sepia. Another photo before white balancing and after white balancing. More examples of what we can see, how it's adapted to specific coloring, to specific light inside and outside. As I said, we need to teach the sensor to adapt to specific coloring. And how we do that, we will see in the following slides. I will ask you another question, one more question this time, to see, to, to see how we can uh, teach the sensor. And first question that comes is, if we look at this photo, which you can see on this slide, I will ask you, what is the average color of this photo? You can see a simple photo and the question is, what is the average color? We see it, we look at the photo and we see white, we see black, we see some shades of gray and in the middle a big patch of gray. If we sum them up, all the colors here and uh, think about the average, it's natural to conclude that the average color of this photo, of this frame is gray. This is natural if we consider all the colors in the frame. I will move to another photo and this time this uh, frame is full of colors and I will ask you the same thing. What is the average color of this photo? If we look at it, we see again on the bottom part some shades of gray and on the upper part we see a lot of colors, some red, some blue, some green. What happens if we add them up? Some patches miss red, some patches have red, some patches miss blue, some patches miss, miss green. But the surprise is that if we patch them up, if we add them up together and compute the average, again, we will see that this uh, color card has an average of gray. And um, we will use this thing that this average color of this photo is gray to learn the sensor how to adapt to colors. And this is done with what we call the gray world assumption and the gray world algorithm. What we will teach the sensor is the fact that the gray color is gray for us and it means that it must be gray for the sensor as well. Of course, this must be done in the ambient light. So the light must be taken into account in this calculation. So for this, we use this color checker card, which we see in this photo, which is exactly what I shown you previously, the gray assumption. So actually we take the assumption that every scenery, which is diverse enough, is gray. How we will implement this in our driver in video for Linux to adapt to our, um, our driver, our pipeline, our hardware, our software to teach the sensor to understand that we have a gray scenery and adapt our gray color to be gray for us as well. So we will take this photo, which is we see on the left side, which you've seen previously in the presentation, but now we will have a closer look at it. And we see that this photo is somehow greenish with a very low blue. This is uh, visible with the naked eye. And actually we want to uh, emphasize the gray world. We want to adapt this scenery to be gray in average. Gray in average means that all the components of the photo, the green, the red, and the blue have the same amount in the average. To do that, we use what is called the histogram. The histogram is computed by the hardware and the histogram tells us exactly how much of each color is inside the frame, the photo. If we look on the left side, right side of this slide, we will see the histogram for each channel. We see a histogram for red, for green, and for blue. This histogram is actually a representation of how many pixels of each value we have in the frame. 
we can see looking at the histogram that uh, there are more pixels of high value of green rather than blue. So we see that green is predominant in this uh, photo by looking at judging by the histogram. We have also red, but the blue is very low. So looking with the naked eye at the photo, we see the same thing. The fact that there is little blue in this photo and that there is plenty of green. So doing this computation, this uh, histogram, we can see this. So what can we do to adapt our um, hardware and software to solve this problem and to adjust the photo such that it will look fine? We apply the gray world algorithm that everything is gray. So we need to adjust this histogram to look the same for every channel. And how we do that, we compute the average of the photo, the average of the gray, and then we adjust the red and the blue and the green to make it such that they are aligned. And we divide the sum of the red, the sum of the blue by the average, and we compute uh, two things which are called the gain and the offset. The gain is a multiplier on a channel and the offset is a constant which is added or subtracted from the channel. So each channel is uh, associated with a gain and an offset. So we'll actually, the gain will multiply the channel, it will uh, increase the values while the offset will just add to every pixel. So once we apply the gray world and we compute these gains and offsets and we apply them on the channel, we obtain the photo which we call is a white balance adjusted. So if we look again at this photo which is white balance adjusted and we compute again the histograms for this photo, we can see on the right side that the histograms for the channels are nearly identical. And what this means that the histogram for the channels are nearly identical is that if we sum them up, we actually obtain gray. So the average photo of this white balance adjusted photo is gray. Exactly what we wanted to obtain with the gray world algorithm. And looking on the left side photo, which is now um, fixed, it looks much better and the colors are much more natural about what we expect when we look at the scenery and the photo which we take with our camera. To do this in a video for Linux and how video for Linux exposes this interface for us is done through the video for Linux controls. And here I have a slide uh, showing the exact values of the controls. It may look uh, confusing at start, but if we take a closer look, we can see the exact um, gains and offsets, which I was saying previously, we have a red component gain, a blue component gain, green, red component gain, and green, blue for the buyer array. If you remember, you have a green cell on the red row and a green cell on the blue row. So we have four channels in the buyer array. And by default, these have a spe you have specific values, which are 512 for the gains and zero for the offsets. So these are the default values. And once we apply the gray world algorithm by doing the do white balance procedure, applying the gray world one time, Video for Linux helps us with this control, which is do white balance. We press this control and we have the values obtained. And we can see on our photo that uh, the gain for the blue, for example, now is 3000. You can see it with red in the slide. You see it increased a lot. And the green component offsets are negative so we see that the, um, the gains and offsets have been adjusted in a way somehow we expected this. We expected that the blue is increased with a high gain and the green is reduced by using a negative offset. So this is what we actually expected by looking at the histogram. So video for Linux controls helps us with this, um, implementing this um, on the photo, on the channels. And we also have a control that um, will do this gray world adjustment for us in the driver inside the hardware pipeline and in software, the gray world algorithm. This is how it looks from a command line perspective, but uh, what it happens when we have an embedded Linux camera, it looks maybe something similar to this. Maybe you have seen this on a camera, you have an exactly white balance button. And uh, this exact same thing happens when you press the white balance button, it will auto adjust the gains and the offsets for you. Instead of using a difference control behind it, you will just press a button, which in fact leads to the same thing and call to the video for news API that goes to the driver and it will call the white balance algorithm inside the driver. So this is 
a clear picture of what the white balance button does for an embedded Linux camera. What happens with cameras usually is what we call the auto white balance. This is a, actually a simple white balance that is performed uh, continuously all the time, such that if we moved from a scenery to scenery, it will adjust automatically to the specific light. So you can see this, even if you experiment your smartphone, you will uh, move your smartphone from one light to another, and you will see how the white balance adjusts to the specific light. If you move from indoor to outdoors, for example. Another way to present the gains and the offsets, if the command line is not really very clear, you can even make a, a GUI for this with sliders that you can uh, manually adjust. The auto white balance has also some drawbacks. If, for example, the scenery is not really gray, maybe you are, uh, you're using your phone inside of a red patch photo or red box or something like that, it will auto adjust to get the red part of the scenery into gray. Which is a pitfall of this algorithm, which is not perfect, of course. It can be improved by different other aspects, like detecting the gray object inside a photo, or maybe do like uh, Photoshop is doing, uh, doing two white balances, one for black and one for white. And of course, you can experiment and do manual tuning, as I said earlier, just move the sliders and see the effect it has on the white balance procedure on your camera and on the resulting photo. To continue and to complete this chapter regarding white balance, uh, I also added a part of the diagram regarding the system. As you can see how the user can interact with the white balance module inside Video for Linux, inside the driver. So the user space through an user space application will call the interface API. And uh, actually the sensor control driver will be called to adjust the white balance with the gains and the offsets. And the pixel stream coming from the sensor from the previous stage of the pipeline will be adjusted according to the values inside the hardware. And in the end, the resulting image will be taken again through the interface to the back to the user space to the, to the user. So this is a, a small diagram of what happens inside the system when the user adjusts the, the gains and the offsets from a video for Linux control and the video for Linux perspective. So this was the discussion related to white balance and how we can teach the sensor to adapt to white balance and to the, the, the temperature of the light of the scenery. What I will try to explain next is another challenge, another issue that we can have with our sensor, with the image capture and image acquisition, is the what we call the quantity of light. And um, the question is, does it matter how much light we absorb during our sensor and how can this affect the photo that we take and uh, how can we solve that or how can what algorithm we can apply? How can we try to find a solution and uh, how can the driver or the hardware or video for Linux help us to obtain a better quality of the photo that we take? So let's have a look at the following photos. On the left side, we have a photo which we can see that it has a lot of light in it. There are a lot of white pixels. And on the right side, we have a much more natural photo. It's much more clear and much better. And what I can tell you is that the photo on the left side is overexposed, meaning that the, the pixels are much more um, saturated with light and uh, there are many white pixels. So we cannot really distinguish anything from the white pixels in this photo. You can see another type of photo in the left side. Again, you have a photo which is with very little light. And this time you can see that we have a lot of black pixels. So um, the pixels are not sensitive to light. And in this case, this photo is underexposed. So we can see a clear difference between an overexposed photo and an underexposed photo compared with uh, somewhat normally exposed photo. And uh, once we see these pictures, we can see the challenge of uh, saying how much exposure we need to select for our sensor and our pipeline or hardware, how we can uh, configure that, how we can select that. And is there a way for the video for Linux or the driver to do this for us? And the answer is yes. 
again, we can use our friend histogram, which can help us to understand how much light we have in a photo and if we can adjust our picture and our frame to make it better. And if you look at the two photos which we looked earlier, one is overexposed and one is underexposed, let's compute a histogram. This time we will not compute a histogram for each channel, the red, the blue and the green. We will compute a complete histogram, a sum of the whole histogram, the whole channels together, edit them up. And we see on the right side that uh, the histogram looks in a specific way. We have a lot of pixels which are of very high value. And for the dark photo, which is underexposed, we have plenty of pixels which are uh, dark, which are black. So the histogram looks like this for overexposed and for underexposed. Let's see how the histogram should look like for a normal photo. And our normal photo, we can see that our histogram is much more aligned towards the middle. So that means that we have uh, pixels which are in the middle range, not very exposed to light and not very dark. So the goal would be to use this histogram to adjust uh, the gains and the offsets, the, actually the actual exposure for this uh, photo, for the incoming pixel stream, such that we obtain um, what, a photo that we can actually use, a photo we can actually see, not too dark, not too bright. And again, we can use video for linux to control our exposure directly to the sub-device, to the sensor, such that the sensor will expose the, the photo cells more or less for each incoming frame. So again, we have a video for this control with an exposure setting. This can be modified from a command line, from an interface, from an API directly to video for Linux. And if we look at the camera, maybe we know how to use exposure compensation to increase and decrease it directly from a button which can do that for us looking at the camera. So at the high level on the camera, it's a button. If we look at the API, it's a call to the system that will modify the exposure for us in the whole, uh, from the sensor, from the whole pipeline that we obtain. So this is related to exposure that is directly involved with the sensor. On one other aspect, which I wanted to explain is related to brightness. Again, brightness is a video for news control, which can be modified through the API. And I will show you a photo taken from this scenery with a positive brightness applied. So you can see that the pixels are, have a positive brightness. I will show you exactly what that means, a positive brightness applied, but you can see that the, uh, the photo is pretty much um, light and white. If we have a negative brightness applied, we can see the photo is very dark, as in the, the same scenery applied with a negative brightness on this uh, frame capture. This is exactly what I wanted to show you, is the fact that brightness is a uh, constant that is added to the luminosity path inside the pipeline. This means that actual value of the pixel is being uh, increased or decreased with the brightness value coming from the sensor. So um, we have this brightness, we have exposure that is presented earlier. And one question that can come to our mind is, why do we need uh, exposure if we have brightness? And why do we need uh, brightness if we have exposure? The thing is that actually we, they are not the same thing because the exposure will uh, allow more or less light coming into the sensor so we need to have more information about the light, incoming light, while the brown brightness will actually remove some of the information, some of the entropy that we receive from the sensor. What I'm trying to say is that we have an overexposed photo or underexposed photo, regardless of what we do with the brightness, we will not obtain more data from the sensor. If we have only bright pixels, regardless of what brightness we apply, we will get still uh, pixels which are saturated. So actually, if our pixel can detect color or light on uh, 10 bits, we will only use one bit or two bits. So we lose color information, we lose luminosity information by having a photo overexposed or underexposed. So we need both brightness and exposure to obtain a good quality of photo. 
once we have exposure uh, set correctly, we have enough pixel data so we can apply brightness, negative or positive, to obtain a better photo. This was the difference between, uh, between brightness and exposure and how we can use both to obtain high quality photo. So this happens with pixel data. We can see also on this small skin that we also have contrast. I especially uh, left this on this slide. So we can move to contrast, which we can see that contrast is actually a multiplier applied on the luminosity path. But we expect that contrast also adjusts its colors. So if you look at the bigger picture, we can see that brightness can apply as a constant towards our uh, luminosity path. Uh, brightness, yes, as a luminosity path. And contrast will apply as a multiplier to both brightness and colors. And to make it simple inside the hardware or inside the software, we will use what is called the YUV representation in which we convert the RGB space to YUV. And we have a, a separate path for luminosity and a separate two paths for difference from blue and difference from red, which is called CB and CR. And these are multiplied with the specific contrast. And again, video for linux can help us to control this hardware block through the interface, through video for linux controls, and can help us to try to obtain a better quality photo by adjusting these uh, sliders, these knobs on the interface. And we can also see how the contrast can be applied to a specific photo and what are the differences and what is the effect that it can have on the specific photo. Let's look at this photo. This has a small contrast, so the contrast is small. The multiplier is somewhat subunitary. That means that the values will be reduced. And we can see that there is uh, not much brightness and there's not much color in this photo with a low contrast applied. If we apply a higher contrast, we can see that there is also luminosity because contrast is a multiplier on the luma path. And we can also see that the difference in color is greater, the difference in colors is greater because we also apply the contrast as a multiplier between colors on the CB and CR paths, the chroma paths, in the UIUV representation of the colors. So this was the, um, the discussion related to contrast. Again, Video for Linux can help us to, to modify and to alter the pipeline such that we can uh, expect or try to experiment with our pipeline to see if we can obtain a better quality of the, of the image. Again, brightness and contrast from a very high level user perspective can be seen on an embedding Linux camera um, just by having this fancy menu interface where you can just select with some buttons the, the brightness and the contrast that you wish to be applied. But in behind the scenes, again, Video for Linux API comes in and alters the pipeline through the driver directly to the hardware, the underlying hardware. So inside the system, what happens is that the user through uh, Video for Linux control will alter the hardware block, which is uh, corresponding to the exposure correction, contrast, and the brightness settings. Actually, it will call the driver, the sensor control driver, which will compute the necessary adjustments and we'll uh, configure the hardware accordingly, such that the pixel stream that comes out from the hardware pipeline is somewhat more what the user expects to see in the resulting image that is then copied to the user space. And the user can actually take this photo and then uh, use it later on and have a look at it with the display. So this is what happens uh, inside the system. So, in the, as a summary, as a first summary of what I wanted to show you today is um, a small explanation about um, the fact that digital sensors need tuning. Digital sensors just uh, uh, capture light, convert it to binary data, and then what happens in, um, in hardware and software is that we, anyone can use a pipeline that is made of several modules that affect the pixel stream. And this pipeline is also in hardware, but also in software. And video for linux can modify or alter this pipeline through an interface or an API and help the user to obtain better quality photo. I explained to you today some several issues or challenges that can appear during digital photography and uh, how can a driver or um, 
specific hardware product or specific software can uh, try to expose such settings to the user as uh, video for linux captures the images and uh, sends them to the user but it's somewhat somewhat agnostic of what happens here really inside the image we see what happens with the uh, edge detection with interpolation how this can affect the photo we see what happens with white balancing brightness exposure contrast simple things or not so simple things which can affect digital photography how we can use uh, linux and an embedded system embedded camera that can uh, help us in obtaining uh, dig better digital photography and we can see that with buttons with sliders with command line with a real camera that is in a box in fact has a pipeline inside the hardware and how it, this is exposed to the user space can be done for example like in this photo on the right side of the slide which you can see the exact um, sliders which are exposed during the presentation how they can be adjusted such that the user has a more visual interpretation of the controls another kind of summary is the exact complete uh, view of the pipeline of the driver and how the um, the sensor control driver can affect how the user can interact with the system to alter and to solve such kind of issues and challenges because normally things are not really seamless when you take a photo you just look at it there are a lot of plenty of things happening behind the scenes and there are several parameters which can be, uh, affect a lot the quality and the result of the photo so this is the, the small summary of um, as a diagram of what happens inside the system and i will try also now to show you a small demonstration of um, exactly some things which happened which i discussed today during the presentation and for that i have a, a hardware dedicated pipeline next to my site at this moment and i will uh, while you see me on this um, webcam live preview i will also show you another um, live preview using uh, our dedicated pipeline and to see this you will see a live preview um, which is exactly of what my camera is seeing right now so i have next to me a camera with our pipeline and um, it takes frames it performs the wire interpolation it converts into rgb it makes edge detection it performs uh, color correction, white balance, gray world algorithm, and it's, uh, the photo is then uh, streamed over the network so you can see it. And you can also see this time, you can see me as well on this photo. So hello. And I will show you some examples of what happens uh, in the ambient scenery. As we discussed, maybe you remember this little friend which I uh, shown you in the presentation and you can see if I um, get this uh, card, Chikorochikar card nearby the camera, how the white balance algorithm will apply and the auto white balance will adjust and try to understand how different colors are adjusted. You can see now uh, the light becomes maybe more bluish because at some point uh, it will detect, it will try to adjust the gray and we do not have an average gray in this scenery. You can see how the algorithm will auto adjust itself to the ambient light. Now it's more greenish and now it's adjusted. It's adjusted again to the ambient scenery. This color checker card can help us with that. So once we have the color checker card inside the whole frame, the colors are perfect according to the gray world algorithm. Once we remove it, it will try to adjust to what's in the scenery. Maybe it's gray, maybe it's not gray. Maybe if you see something like this fully red, it will try to adjust this red to gray, which is a pitfall of the algorithm. So this is what I wanted to show you related to white balance and what we discussed today during this presentation. I hope you enjoyed this live demo, even if it's uh, not uh, done on the moment, but it's uh, live right now as I'm recording this. And 
This is all related to the presentation. We have a separate uh, questions, Q&A section. And in the end, I provided with uh, resources related to where is the driver inside the Linux kernel and links to all the photos and the uh, board that were used to capture the scenery that you've seen in today's presentation. So thank you very much for attending. The video for challenges of using video for news tool to capture and uh, process video images. I hope the presentation was uh, of interest for at least some of you. And uh, I wait for you for the um, live Q&A session after this presentation. So thank you.